I'm going to go off. Hello and welcome to episode two of Patio Perspectives. I'm your host, Paul Salinger. I'm a board member of the Society for Sustainable Events and also a former VP of marketing at Oracle, where I led the uh, global uh, initiative for sustainability for events. Uh, Patio Perspectives is a combination of short essays on event sustainability topics combined with interview style virtual events that take place on the third Wednesday of every month at noon Pacific. Today we're talking about food and its role in events and how the choices we make when it comes to food can be a part of your carbon reduction strategy. Our core belief is that we emit too much carbon and we consume and waste too much when it comes to live events. So let me just set a little context before I introduce our guest for today's perspective. Let's state the obvious, everyone eats. The thing about food at events though, or even anywhere anyone eats really, is that it's not just about the food on the table. The food system is made up of a number of different components. And I'm gonna share a screen, share something right now, not that, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, okay. So uh, the thing about food and events, though, is that um, it's not just about the food on the table. The food system is made up of a number of components from land use to farming to how we feed animals to processing the food, transporting the food, selling the food, and ultimately disposing of leftover food or the food that never makes it to market. And that whole system creates greenhouse gas emissions which we end up calling carbon in a lot of cases, but includes other potent gases as well. And it produces a lot of waste. Roughly a third of all food produced each year is lost or wasted. Then there's a few other issues with the food system. Here's a list from a recent blog post by, uh, by Soft Godden, many issues associated with the food system that have significant impacts on the climate. I'm not going to go through all of them, but as you can see, many of these things are not even just about food. It might, might be about farming. They might be about uh, decarbonized forests. They might be about how water is um, impacted from the food system. So this, this was a really great list, and I think that it's something that we should all kind of pay attention to when we're starting to think about how we make our food choices, especially for events. And then I'm pretty sure that most of you have seen this particular chart that shows the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food product for a number of different, um, a number of different things. Um, so all of this is to say that while food may only be about 5% of the emissions from an event, it has an overall impact on climate change. And it's an area where the event sector can make a big difference when it comes to the choices we make in our food planning and working with food partners. So I'm thrilled today to have um, to have a really incredible guest, and I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. Hang on. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, the founder and president, I'm thrilled today to have St St Tracy Stuckrath as our guest on Patio Perspectives. Uh, founder and president of Thrive Meetings and Events and host of Eating at a Meeting podcast, Tracy Stuckrath has had a 30 plus year career in corporate association and social event planning. In 2009, her personal health changed the trajectory of her career. She works with organizations worldwide to provide strategic food and beverage training and consulting to enhance employee, guest experience, cultivate culture, and grow revenue. And she is honored to be named a top 25 women in meetings industry from meetings and conventions and a meeting trend center from meetings today. So welcome to Patio Perspectives, Tracy. Thanks, Paul. I'm so excited to be here and to talk to you. You're like one of my idols. <laughs> Thank you. So let's just start with you giving us some background on how you came to focus on food as a sustainability issue, what you're working on, and kind of just the arc of your career. Yeah, I mean, 
I was thinking about that question and it was 13 years ago or 10 years ago this year um, that I spoke at Exhibitor Show for the very first time and as a speaker on food and beverage. And it was literally about food allergies because I am, my perspective changed because I got diagnosed with a food allergy. But over the last 13 years, um, I have realized that talking about food allergies and, and feeding me something, you're going to wait, you're wasting the food. If you're making food for me and I can't eat it, then you've just wasted the $75 plus, 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 plus that you spent on it right. and, and all of the things that go in it to it. So it just really t- turned into a very connected conversation about that mm-hmm. because when we don't think about or, or plan food and beverage at events with intention, then we're we're really wasting an opportunity and wasting the food and which then turns into that sustainability conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So just looking at that chart that I just showed, it seems intuitive mm-hmm. that we should be moving towards a plant-based or at least a default veg strategy in our food planning mm-hmm. uh, for events, given the carbon and methane intensity of animal protein. What are your thoughts on that? Is it always the best way to go? Um, it, it, it's, there's research out there that says, Hey, it does, people are more inclined to eat that plant-based, that default veg version, which is great. And, and I'm always craving vegetables when I come home from events because we, you very rarely see them. So I want to say, yes, it is the great way, a great way to do it. But there are a lot of things going on in our food system. A lot of players that are working for regenerative agriculture aspects of it. So how can we utilize the meats, um, the animal-based foods that are coming from regenerative agriculture um, farms as on land and at sea. Mm -hmm. But I also, in talking on my podcast a couple of weeks ago with Simon McCann from Y Boston Resort in the UK, he was also saying that they've done the research and studies at their own property that when they do that whole push the plant based hundred percent, a lot of it's getting wasted Mm -hmm. because people are looking for that animal protein from that. So how do you balance that out? And we're, we're trying to reduce the carbon footprint on the front end. Yes, that's great. But if we're wasting it all on the back end, that food waste emissions is, it could be a third world country, how much we waste. Well, yeah, not only that, but we know that methane even though it doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long, is like 80 times more potent than carbon is. So exactly. Um, and a lot of that food just goes into landfill, which you know mm-hmm. then becomes methane. Right. Um, are you are you seeing are, are any of your clients really kind of seriously looking at turning their whole events into plant-based or default veg? Or how are they dealing with people that um that do want to have meat? Do they have any kind of like an opt-in kind of a arrangement or how are they dealing with it? They are some of my, my direct clients, it's me behind the scenes, pushing that forward. Yeah. Okay. It's not saying, Hey, we want to do this. Not yet. And I think in even planning menus right now, it is trying to find vegan and, and plant-based options on printed meeting menus is hard. Right. Yeah. And so it's, and a lot of, and I was having a conversation with some planners about this. It's like people a lot of planners negotiate the 10% off on the printed menus. But if you do cut some property, there's like, if you do customize menus, then you lose your discount. Mm-hmm. And so if they're forced to stay within a certain budgetary constraint and can't do it, it's really hard to come by sometimes. Yeah. And it you have to get in into it at the very front end at the RFP stage. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, and are you encouraging your clients to start putting those kinds of criteria into their RFPs and their mm-hmm. contracts and yes. kind of what, what, what's, a, what's the uh, status on that? How are people adop- adopting that? How are people adapting to receiving RFPs or contracts that have that kind of criteria in it? Um, I think it's, they're looking for, they, they're looking for the questions to add into the RFP and especially ones that their sales managers can answer. And that's another problem that we have is that a lot of the hotel sales teams 
are not educated on what their properties can do or already are doing. Right. And and so and I think that comes down to a lot of times really with the franchise properties that we're utilizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's you know when we have a whole overall arching corporate buy from a property, I think that's a, a bigger question. But and I think it's a it's a challenge with the times as well as the staffing. Right. We're we're still coming out of COVID. Right. And bringing right. that staff up. And we have new people in place who don't know, who haven't been trained on exactly what everything does. And I don't want to use that as an excuse. I want to use that as an encouragement. Right. Because if you're getting an Oracle or you're getting a big corporation that's got ESGs built into it, mm -hmm. meeting planners need to be asking these questions. And the properties that are going to be picked are the ones that can answer those questions. Right. And, and even within that, in, in terms of asking the questions, should event planners be pushing to talk directly to the chefs, for example, as opposed to just talking to the sales and marketing people? I would 100% push to, to talk to the chefs. And sometimes, and sometimes it's hard to do, but just say, hey, this program will not be, you will not be selected if we can't talk to the chef to see what the programs are. Because and and actually, I was interviewing um, a food service provider, and we were we were talking about allergens. And my client said, "Well, we're really hesitant to push these these stipulations or these guidelines on our food service providers because they're small businesses, or you know." And she looked at them. She's like, "It's part of their business. Right. It's they're required to understand that, and not necessarily sustainability wise, but food allergies. What they need to know transparency." But I think nowadays, going forward, understanding the sustainability aspects of a property, especially around the food and beverage, is going to be a question that they need to be able to address. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I found that, you know, a lot of chefs were very amenable and really wanted to do sustainability things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we worked closely with a number of chefs, uh, particularly at Moscone Center. Yep. Um, they did a great job of working with us in terms of like, rethinking where they were sourcing things from and trying mm -hmm. to get more local. Um, yep. They were they were very open to using things like imperfect foods, food that was coming from farms that couldn't get into stores. Um, right. So, you know, I don't know. And what that's an awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely the way to go. And it's, mm -hmm. it's getting, and I, and I want to say um, convention centers may be a little bit ahead of the game of some property from ho some hotel properties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think mm -hmm. so. I think yeah. so. So, you know, I started out by talking kind of about, you know, the food system being broader than just the food that we eat in an event and very mm -hmm. systemic in terms of how we grow it, how we transport it, how we package it, how we dispose of it. Um, can you comment on how food choices should be made with a broader lens? You you mentioned regenerative agriculture. That's sort of mm -hmm. one piece of this. Can you just talk a little bit more about kind of that broader lens in the event planning process and how some of these things like regenerative agriculture and, you know, soil and erosion and those kinds of things are playing into some of the choices that we should be making around food. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's getting outside of that, that printed menu, right. And asking yeah. these questions and saying, who are you sourcing from? And, and that's a legitimate question to be asking when yeah. you're, when you're talking about your food and beverage and, I remember chatting with the executive chef at the Hyatt Regency Atlanta, uh -huh. and I used to see him at the farmer's market on Saturdays, and he was going and talking to all of those farmers directly, yeah. and while he wasn't incorporating all of those foods, they didn't make enough to incorporate it into a 7,000 7, person banquet, but he was finding other ways to incorporate it into the property, yeah. and, and that is a very fair question to be asking because the transportation of that, he's reducing his cost on transportation. Absolutely. He is um, supporting a local person, local economy in doing that, and, you know, a local family at the same time. That's right. And it reminds me of one of my local farmers that I buy from at the farmer's market. They do sell to some restaurants and where I am, we don't have a huge convention center. So we're selling to small caterers and hotels, but they're changing their model and doing a a mobile cart once a week instead of going to the farmer's market because mm -hmm. of the family dynamics right now that are happening. Yeah. And so looking at where we're sourcing and how we're sourcing it and who, you know, is it, 
um, how diverse is the sourcing as well? Are you looking at just white farmers or are you right. looking at the biopic, you know, market out there? Who's got that? Exactly. Incorporating some of those things in there. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously and, different regions have different diversity, but, right. um, mm-hmm. but absolutely. I mean, another example is we did an event uh, in December at the one hotel in San Francisco, which is mm-hmm. literally right across the street from the San Francisco Ferry Building and the farmer's market that runs mm-hmm. there. They were sourcing uh, almost all of their food for, directly from that farmer's market. And they had a really good program in terms of like not only sourcing the food, but really thinking about the whole food and trying to like really reduce their food waste. Right. Yeah. Well, and one chef who's now he's at Emory now, but he was at the Georgia International Convention Center. He when he came in at that job and he was there for at least a decade, um, he they had a corporate buy spend. Right. And he's like, can if I I'm going to save you money if I can get out of this. And he's like, let me prove it, right? And he ended up canceling the contract with the with the big food distributor mm-hmm. and going 100% local. I, I say 100% local, majority local. Yeah. And he ended up helping these local farmers grow their businesses and and buy trucks and sell outside of just him. Mm-hmm. And, and that worked so much better. And he ended up saving the convention center money. Yeah. In the long run. And yeah, which I think is really great. And, I, you know, it's it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Of like, you know, if we're going to if we're going to really focus on sustainability and work on that, you know, how can we start rewarding people that are actually doing that kind of work? And right. what you're talking about right now absolutely fits into that model of like, you know, can we, you know, work with our properties, work with the venues on how they're sourcing and actually rewarding people that are doing sustainable practices? Mm hmm. Well, and Mark Cooper and I have talked about this um, and with Mark's with the CEO of IAC mm-hmm. and he has a planner that he references and I won't reference the company name here without his permission. But there's they had one hundred thousand dollars to spend on sourcing, doing food waste management and all of that. And they wanted to put it into their program. And they're like, we're going to give you one hundred thousand dollars to the extra so that we can manage that. And the hotel said no. Hmm. And because they didn't want to go through the steps of really kind of figuring it out. And and it may be time constraints, it may be staffing constraints, whatever it is. But this major corporation was willing to fork out on an additional $100,000 to do that. And they were denied. Hmm. And and another planner that I know, and this is from... um, Jim Spellows, right? Oh, uh-huh. this this planner had put it in the contract. We're going to donate all of our food after the fact, and and two weeks out, the hotel's like, please don't make us do this. Really? Yeah, and it was it was this has been this is pre COVID, but still they're like, and he was just that planner was flabbergasted going into the back of the house and seeing all these potatoes and all of this stuff yeah. that's just going to go in the trash right. can. Right. So it's yeah. we have to get. And and it's the food ma- or the hotel property owners and management companies that we really I think need to get on board. I think the Marriott Globals on a on a broader perspective mm-hmm. are really in on this, but it's yeah. it's getting down deeper into yeah. the trenches of this. Yeah, I mean it is a lot of education, a lot of behavior mm-hmm. change that right. needs to happen before we can really you know make the progress that we would like to make. Uh, let me stop here for one second and just, uh, again, welcome everybody in the audience. If you have any questions, um, put them in the in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, we'll try to get to them, you know, down the road. Um, so you mentioned, you've mentioned regenerative agriculture a couple of times. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we should just describe for people who may not know what regenerative agriculture actually is. Can you maybe give us an example. I know you've worked with a couple of different farms that are doing yeah. regenerative agriculture. And I, I'm i not going to give you the blanket, like scientific right. answer on this, but, and I actually really first saw it when I was, I attended the Slow Food um, Terra Madre Salon mm-hmm. Gusto event in Italy a couple of years ago. And Europe had this program called for soil, it was a campaign about regener- regenerating our soil, and that's yeah. really what it is is about. And it's rotating our crops, rotating our animals, mm-hmm. so that the soil is getting the nutrients that it needs to regenerify and regrow. 
um, and, and make that soil healthier because there's a lot of farms out there with chemicals, pesticides, things on it that have killed the soil and yeah. the soil can't grow really well, you know, unless we, we start doing that. And Will Harris from White Oak Pastures is one that's very passionate about it and has converted their farm and they've got cows and pigs and chickens on there. Mm-hmm. Cows, pig, those are all three different animals, making sure I called them all differently. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also just that organic matter, I mean, because it really does help um, regentrify the soil. And and I actually meant to bring it up here, but yesterday I was working at Starbucks, you know, just sitting outside enjoying the sun. Uh-huh. And I went inside and they have a basket now. Here is a bag this big of here's coffee grounds to take home. It was free. Uh-huh. And I'm like, okay, so convention centers, what are we, you know, hotels, what are we yeah, doing yeah. about that? But I'm like, my local Starbucks is giving away coffee grounds so I can go put it on my plants and my vegetables to regentrify and make that soil healthier. Mm-hmm. And they actually gave some information about the carbon of it and, mm-hmm. and how it can actually make the soil healthier. So that's what that regentrification in a non-scientific way means. Yeah. And I think, I think I've also seen even examples of uh, some, some farmers who are doing regenerative agriculture, adding in things like restoring marshlands, restoring peat bogs as carbon sinks to go along with what they're doing from a farming perspective, which again... Mm-hmm you know, helps in terms of sequestration of carbon, helps with, mm-hmm. you know, you know, just that whole idea of regenerating the soil. So. Right. Well, and one of my friends, Will, is working with a um, company to help local farmers there um, with the trees, right? Because we mentioned the deforestation, right? We're clearing mm-hmm. forests to create farms. They're actually trying to work with farmers and event planners to say, hey, we're going to do the carbon offsets with a local farmer, mm-hmm. educate them on selling their carbon by keeping the trees, right? So, yeah. and and that's just another way to look at it too, because well, that collects the carbon. Yeah, I mean, I think this is another way even of looking at partnership within the event mm-hmm. system in terms of like, um, you know, could we partner with a local farmer who's doing regenerative agriculture, reward them by giving them a sense of how much food they should grow and what type that we're going to yeah. use that we're going to buy from them. And, and in the same sense, you know, giving back to them. So if we create any compost or anything from our event, we give it back to that farmer, they can reuse it. Love it. So it, create, mm-hmm. it creates kind of a nice carbon cycle, if you will, in terms right. of, you know, how to, how to partner differently, how to think about partnering differently and how to, you know, write an RFP or a contract that has some criteria in it that talks about different kinds of partnerships. I, I love it. And it reminds me of a, it would, this is a restaurant, but I think it's the Woodbury in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. They had partnered with the local farmer and I went on a tour at the farm and they were like, okay, grow the, this is what we're going to serve this season, you know, by season. Yeah. And in the summertime, they were canning all the tomatoes and everything mm-hmm. and the cans were all over the, that was the decor on the restaurant wall. Right. I've, I've seen that in a couple of other restaurants as yeah. well. And yeah. And I remember going to a convention center years ago with a farmer friend of mine. I'm like, she's got, the farmer had 300, I don't know how many pounds of butternut squash. And I went to the convention center. I'm like, hey, can you do that? And they're like, well, we don't want that. I'm like, <laughs> come on, let's let's think yeah. about what we can do with all that farm. So, and she, Charlotte ended up selling it, you know, that butternut squash. But I'm like, let's be forth, forward thinking. And chop it up, freeze it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, there's so like much creativity we could create. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's switch gears here for one second. Okay. I, I knew you told, I know you told me that May is allergy and celiac disease awareness month. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us more about that and how those things should be considered when planning a food strategy for an event. Yeah. And I have my teal on to celebrate food allergy awareness. Um, so food allergies and celiac disease. And I was chatting with my, um, with a chef this just today, earlier today, Martha Morgan, um, about how she saving food allergies or planning for food allergies and celiac disease. Actually, she was able to save 13% on her food costs at a, at a hospital. But what it does is if we're not asking about the dietary needs of our attendees, we're, we're throwing food away. We're throwing our budgets away. 
because we're not considering that in the in the forefront and thinking about incorporating those needs across the board, right? Mm-hmm. In in the overall menu planning. And I'm not saying eliminate all top nine allergens from every single thing that you're serving, because that would be really <clears throat> hard and impossible. Right. But I am saying, hey, if somebody is allergic to sesame seeds, right? Which is a new top nine allergen. Make sure there's no sesame in the entire event. Mm-hmm. That's not going to make or break anything that you're serving, right? right? And and even this hotel that I'm working with, she's like, well, send us the, the people with the dietary needs and we'll just make them all different plates. <laughs> like that's a time waste. It's a food waste. You know, it's, it's, it's not thinking holistically about it. Right. And when I asked her about that, she's like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, can we, I'm like, I'm just going to make, I have somebody who's anaphylactic to nuts. And I'm like, I want to eliminate all nuts from every single thing that we're doing at our event. Right. Nobody's, that's not going to, nobody's going to think about it. Right. Yeah. Um. So it's really being thoughtful about it and being conscientious about it so that you're not wasting your money and your food. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's, how, how should planners go about getting that information and making sure that they're again, putting it into their yep. overall event planning process. Definitely asking the questions um, on your registration form. And, and one thing to add about that is that in 2008, and I don't know if you knew this, but in 2008, the Americans with Disabilities Act was amended. Hmm. And with that, that. Am- with the amendment, and because it was becoming very exclusive versus inclusive mm-hmm. law. And so they added the words eating, breathing, and all of our bodily functions as major life activities, mm-hmm. which means anybody that um, ha- has to eat a specific way so as not to be harmed or potentially die now has civil rights protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Got it. So we do have to legally provide some options and they need to be equal quality options um, so I always like to ask when when we're asking about um, providing accessibility in proper in events, and we should be thinking about accessibility across the board. Yeah. It's about how we get to the plate, mm-hmm. as well as what's on the plate yeah. that we need to be conscientious about. So yeah. asking, do you have a food allergy, celiac disease, or other dietary need? And then look and work with your chefs to plan those menus around them and, yeah. and make sure you're reporting it well in advance. Right. Um, You know, and I know in this country, we have the ADA, we have the American Mm -hmm. Disabilities Act. What about for international events? I don't know if you're doing much in the way of international events, but is there any advice you might have for people who are working internationally that are working in countries that may not have the same level of protection under an ADA? Well, we do have the strongest disability awareness, but it is is becoming a lot more... um, aware in other countries. So the European Union in 2014 actually put in a law that says all unpackaged food must be labeled in writing um, with any of the top 14 allergens. In the U.S., we only have nine. In the EU, it's 14. Okay. And so there is a lot more, you will see a lot more labeling or weight service staff aware of what they're serving, Mm -hmm. what allergens are in there. The UK is getting a lot more stringent about it, more so than EU is because one young lady passed passed away on a plane from eating mm-hmm. something that wasn't labeled. Yeah. Um. So they're trying to clear those loopholes. So, um, it is. One caterer said to me in in Scotland, I was giving a presentation and and I was actually she was on a panel, and I was asking her questions. She was the only one in the room of fifty, and the rest were incentive. Um, planners, nobody knew about the law. Mm. And she was adamant. She's like, I can't, I could lose my business if you don't ask these questions. Right. If I'm not planning for it. And because they're seriously audited. Yeah. Um, and and controlled. And so we as planners who have the direct connect with our attendees need to make sure that we're supporting, like you said, it's regenerative. We need to support our people who are feeding us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, back, way back when I was on the board of the Green Meeting Industry Council, we kind of used this term FLOSS, uh, F-L-O-S-S, mm-hmm. which stood for fresh, local, organic, seasonal, and sustainable. 
that still seems applicable to me. Any thoughts on that as an approach to menu planning and how it actually does help with our attempts at carbon and other greenhouse gas emission reduction? All right, well, I have to take same memory though. We were together in Portland. Yes. At Green Meetings Industry Council a conference and there was that poster in the kitchen right, of that exactly. double tree. I think that's exactly. when I first met that's you, the, yeah. That's exactly where it came from, was from that yeah. double tree in Portland. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can still vision that. And uh -huh. that was a long time ago. That was a long time um, ago. No, I definitely think it is completely applicable. Um, fresh, local, organic, seasonal, and sustainable. Listen, sustainable, a hundred percent. It it totally applies to everything that we can do. It's just asking the questions. And I know I've got a couple of checklists on you know on hey, here's some questions to ask. Where are you sourcing your fish from? Who are you sourcing mm -hmm. your chickens from? And people are like, well, what do I know if right the what the right answer is? Well, the right answer is if they can give you an answer. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean exactly. First and foremost is like, if they're like, huh, right? That's a big clue. But if they can address some of these things, it's really important to start with. But it, it is asking the questions of our partners, where are you sourcing your food from? It, it really does seem to come back to that in a lot of cases, just asking the right questions and yeah. following up and, you know, mm -hmm. really, really understanding, you know, the locations and the venues that you're working with and where they're sourcing from and you know, mm -hmm. if you want to, if you want to run a truly sort of floss event, um, you know, you really do have to ask those questions because a lot of, a lot of venues either don't know, don't care, or, you know, will kind of like try to just bypass that question when you ask them. It, it, exactly. And I think, you know, we can learn more when we ask more questions, right? Yeah. Not only are we learning, because we might not know, like, hey, you're in the middle of Tennessee and that hotel doesn't know the questions, but, and I know there was a story in one of the meetings magazines about a planner who had gone to a property and said, well, we want to donate our food, any excess food after the fact. And they're like, well, we don't do that. Yeah. And I've actually been at a property that says that, well, we don't do that. Well, this planner told the story of how she went out and found the partner right. for that convention center. And that convention center has now partnered with them full time to do that. So we may do need to be doing a little bit more of the legwork up front, which my pun is that meeting planners have a ton of food already on their plate or not food, but are <laughs> things on their plate to, right. to handle. Right. And we're adding that to it, but it makes us better stewards for our jobs yeah. and, and the planet and yeah. potentially for the bottom line. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's talk about packaging for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of events do things like box lunches or other types of pack package lunches that might involve single use plastic or you know just non sustainable materials how do we how do we make those more sustainable I, again it probably comes down to asking a lot of questions but right. you know how 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 can planners work with their venues their chefs whomever they're dealing with from a food and beverage standpoint to really impress upon them the need to use compostable packaging and or sustainable materials in their packaging if they're doing those kinds of um you know, box lunches or packaged lunches? Well, I, I think, again, it's, it's asking the question, but I do think a lot of it comes down to the cost of some of it too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I live in a small town and, and Paul, it drives me nuts because I think there's one restaurant that does not use styrofoam in my town. And, right. <laughs> and, and that's the cheapest thing. And it weighs less, you know, yeah. than some <laughs> of this other things. So it does come down to a cost perspective. But if you can bring a player to the table, unintended mm -hmm. that can help them and maybe introduce them to other alternatives. I actually got a press release from a company for the that's exhibiting at the National Restaurant Association show this week. And um, I'm going to go meet with them because that's what they do. But it is saying, okay, I, I don't know if you can hear the ice dropping in the background um, <laughs> behind me, but um, the reusable plateware, reusable silverware, reusable napkins is definitely better for the environment ver um, than the next one would be that compostable version of that. Mm -hmm. But we need to be making sure that we're also buying it from legitimate companies that are selling the compostable things, but saying, do we have the staff to, to wash the dishes and to wash the linens and things like that? Where's your staffing levels on that? 
first mm -hmm. and foremost, but yeah. definitely saying, hey, with these box lunches, what are you serving it with? Can we, because, and actually I'm ordering a box lunch for an event next month. <laughs> what is it served in, right? right? Can we use, even though they're having a box, box lunch or a box lunch, can we use reusable silverware? But then how mm -hmm. do you collect that all, right? Right. So it's really, it's the logistics question of it and how can yeah. we partner with them to for the logistics of it? I hope that yeah. answered your question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, I think it did. Um, you know, I think I, I, part, of, part of me wants to always ask the question though of like, why are we so focused on cost all the time? Why does it always have 100%. to come down? Why does it have mm -hmm. to come, always come down to cost? Mm -hmm. You know, is it more important to save a dollar here when it's going to cost the planet and society three dollars down the road in right. terms of the cost of landfilling things, the cost of, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, I, it, it's really amazing to me that it always ends up coming down to a, a cost issue when, you know, what we should be doing is looking mm -hmm. at it again more holistically in terms of mm -hmm. like, what's the right way for us as an industry to think about these issues? Because long term, if the climate change becomes worse than it is, and if you know if landfills get worse than they are and the seas rise, we may not even have an event industry. So, would you rather yeah. pay now or pay pay now or pay later? One hundred percent agree with you. And and actually, Martha and I were talking about this earlier today on my podcast because she was saying she worked for corporate hospital company and yeah. she saved thirteen thousand thirteen percent of her food cost incorporating the dietary needs into the things, but it came down to, oh, well, no, we've just brokered a deal and we can get this stuff for even less mm. than that. So the sales pitch, you know, how do we figure out that sales pitch to say, it's a good thing for the earth. It's also a good thing for the bottom line in the long run. And, and I think the more we incorporate some of these things into smaller aspects, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we can do that buying power, but it is, it's tracking it. Yeah. Right? Well, and let's talk about that for a second, because I, 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 I totally get that, you know, convention centers have uh, contracts with big food distributors and mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, they get bulk pricing and all of these kinds of things. How do we how do we work around that when we're starting to think about regenerative agriculture and different kinds of partnerships and, you know, kind of breaking that barrier of like, well, you know, we have a contract, we're buying this for a certain price, we can't, you know, can't go against that. Right. Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, um, it, 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 I think it's comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges, right? Yeah. And saying, hey, can we do a cost comparison? And it's just like the chef at the Georgia International Convention Center who said, let me do this. You know, let me show you how I can do this, right? And And if it doesn't work, then we go back the other way. But it's also looking at, okay, we're looking at our food and beverage here. Can we do this right now and, and try it? And then we're going to, not going to cut back, but hey, we're not spending this much more money on paper brochures anymore, right? Right. So we can filter that money into this right. aspect. Right. And so looking at your budget holistically as well mm -hmm. to saying, hey, mm -hmm. you're saving a dime over here. Yeah. And if I put that dime over here, it's, the the as long as we're allowed to manage our budgets the way that we can to stay in budget and it it doesn't matter where I spend it. Is it, is it sense? also is it, I mean we're talking about cost from a money perspective, but is it mm -hmm. also kind of looking at if you're talking about apples to apples, can we look at it from the standpoint of what's the carbon cost of it? What's mm -hmm. the transportation and food miles right. cost of it? You know, are there other factors that event planners could be looking at? besides just pennies or yeah. dollars in terms of, you know, looking at their food choices and thinking about it from a carbon reduction perspective. 100%. And I think it needs to be done that way, but I also think it's a challenge to find people. I mean, you need to find hire a Sean McKinley, McKinley to come <laughs> in and manage that for you, right. To, to really monitor that carbon footprint of that. And I mean, I I spent the other day a couple of hours trying to find a an online footprint yeah. calculator, mm -hmm. and it's really just the footprint calculator of what I'm doing at home, 
Right. 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 And, right. and kind of understanding where that is, but. Yeah. And having to try to extrapolate numbers of for a larger audience. Exactly. Exactly. And if you yeah. don't know how to calculate the carbon, you know, and, and Sean has said that to me on my podcast, it's like, you really need to have somebody that understands how to do that. And it's yeah. not, it's not in a meeting planner's wheelhouse necessarily. No, we would have to learn whole new skill sets. <laughs> right, exactly. So a different number crunching for sure. But I think, yeah. I think it's our duty to do that because yeah. I mean, we're bringing people together and we mm -hmm. do have a large carbon mm -hmm. footprint as far as, like you said, will we be meeting again? And people are wanting to get back, but think people are also making really smart decisions on whether, Hey, do I need to go to that event? Right. And if they are choosing to go to your event, then they're choosing it to go for a specific reason. And we need to make that reason one that's going to be around in the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I, and I just think the numbers are there that people, the international food information council has a lot of great stats on what people are, looking for in their food and beverage. And that includes, they want to make sure that fair, fair wages are paid. Right. They are making 50, I think it's 52% of people are making decisions on their food, their food and beverage choices are on whether it's sustainable. Right. And, and then within that group, it's like, they think their choices around food and beverage have an impact on the climate change. And so if that's 50% of people, yeah. Right. Or thinking about that, then why aren't we looking at it? Right. Exactly. Um, before we kind of wrap up, I wanted to mm -hmm. get one question that came in. Um, going back a little bit, can you expand on talking to chefs? Uh, do you get pushback from hotel teams because of too much demand on chef's time? If so, how do you navigate around that? It's I yes, they get get a lot of pushback, especially um when you've already signed the contract and the CSM's like you know, we're not available. And, and you, at a program last April, I mean, it was the, the chefs were very hard to get a hold of, yeah. right. And answering questions. And, but I, it's, I think go at it with the perspective of, we want to partner with you on this and we yeah. want to create an event that showcases your skill set yeah. and the practices that you're doing so that we can then communicate to our attendees, Hey, this is chef. This is what they're doing. This is how they're feeding us. Um, and, and, and showcase all of their, I mean, there is this practice that we pull out the culinary team and all the servers and say, thank mm -hmm. you for feeding us, mm -hmm. especially when you have, I got a program next month that probably has 20 food functions or more mm -hmm. in it. Those people are working their rear ends off to feed us. <laughs> Definitely. Well, <laughs> and and it, it's also, another, it's also another way of, uh, rewarding venues for doing the right thing right if, if, exactly. if you know if if, we, if they allow us to talk to the chefs and work work a different kind of program and we then communicate that out to our attendees and to our own staff and our management and out into the broader world and start rewarding venues that are doing the right thing ideally that creates business for them as well right mm hmm a hundred percent. And it, and I think the first reward is getting the piece of business in the first place. Right. Right. You we just awarded you a hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollar program, whatever it is. I mean, my food and beverage budget for next month is five hundred and thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars before taxes. Or oh, yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, mean so, our food, our food beverage at Oracle Open World was ridiculous. It was like three yeah. million dollars or something. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, I haven't had managed that, but I'm like. $500,000 is a big chunk of change to spend on it food is. and beverage. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I want to make sure that it is being done respectfully to the, the people making the food to feed us specifically, as well as the people who grew the food. Yeah. And, yeah. and maybe we can bring that program back and it, you never know who's in the audience. Right. And that company may have their own event next month yeah. or next six months that needs a hotel that wants to, mm -hmm. you know, do that same kind of thing. And, and I don't think that we necessarily think about that as planners as well. When we're planning an event, we're like, Hey, we're bringing all these attendees in here. They all work for companies that do right. meetings. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. All right. So one big topic that we haven't really hit on is the whole mm -hmm. idea of food waste. 
How should we how should we approach the whole issue of food waste and food donation? Because that is like one of the biggest issues that we probably have is how much we sort of overconsume and how much mm -hmm. we waste in the event industry. It's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. um, and I am going to Europe again. I went to the um, oh the World's Fair right mm -hmm. um, in Milan a couple of years ago because it was all about food. Mm -hmm. And the first exhibition was about food waste, and that really that was 2015. It blew me away. I'm like, it was like 30 to 40% of the food, 40% of the food in the United States is wasted. So as an event planner, let's just talk about that number right there. If you have a, I have $530,000 food and beverage budget. What's, what's 40% of that? I'm going to do that really quickly. 530 times 0.4. That means 212,000, 200. Yeah. Could be wasted. Yeah if I'm not planning correctly. So some things to think about when you're planning that is know your numbers, mm -hmm. you know, pay attention to who, how many people ate at your events last year, how many people came. And I know the numbers are changed last year might not be a good way to look at it, but your right. numbers are changing, but really study the percentage of people who come to your food functions across the board. Um, pay attention to what they're eating um, and what they're not eating. And, and what's being thrown away, because why are you going to order croissants for a group of people who don't eat croissants the next time, right? right? And I do think that is one challenge we also have with our food and beverage, the standard contracts, because this is what they're serving right. in a continental breakfast, right. you know, without getting upcharged for a lot of things. But those two things are, are really paying attention to what your numbers were in the past and yeah. what food or food is eating. But if your food and beverage functions are not mandatory requirements to eat or to attend, then you need to ask your attendees, do you plan on attending this event? Right. And, and those numbers may be, may vary. The percentages may vary, but Paul, if Paul, you and I are going and we're going to go eat dinner outside. We've decided we're not going to go to that right. cocktail reception. We're going to go right. find dinner. Yeah, exactly. So why are you ordering dinner for <laughs> me and you mm -hmm. when we're not going to be there? And an email I got, just before we got on the show is from this woman who last year I fed at an event and she's Orthodox Jew mm -hmm. and our event was during Passover. Oh. <laughs> and she had, we both learned because she had never traveled during Passover before. Right, right. And so lots and lots of questions to her and lots and lots of questions to the hotel and the catering company. But I also had two other mm. people who said they were kosher right. and calling them up and saying, okay, what do you are you Orthodox Jew? How, how how strict is your kashrut? And they both could eat off the buffet if we labeled it. Yeah. And so by asking those questions, I saved my client $2,500 in getting food from an offsite caterer. Yeah. So that's another way to look at it too, but it is really looking at your history of food and beverage consumption, your numbers coming in, paying attention to the arrival departure schedules on your room blocks. Um, and, but then the last piece of that is, so you're, so one that you're not order over ordering, but the last piece of that is that you 100% need to donate. And if you do not know about the food donation improvement act, mm -hmm. it came, it was signed into law in January. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it extends the liability protection from the good Samaritan bill Emerson, good Samaritan act. It, it amplifies the protection that you have from donations yeah and there is, is no reason is it a, not to donate is it applicable everywhere across the united states it, yes it is 100 percent. because i know you know that a lot of venues still say oh we can't do that because of local regulations yeah no it's 100 percent <clears throat> applicable across the united states yeah, yeah. And so we, and <clears throat> so we should we should really be working with venues and chefs on uh you know mitigating food waste by doing food donation and really pushing 100%. them on finding the right partners to do that with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's couple, there's companies that are nationwide that are doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also find the local ones. And one of the, the new things with the um, food donation improvement act is that now you can actually, you don't need to hundred percent go to a food bank to make the donation. You can actually do it to smaller companies and, and those smaller companies can actually ask for a small fee to do it because there's a cost Yeah. As, besides the 
planet cost. There is a cost to driving the car to picking mm -hmm. it up, mm -hmm. the equipment, the, the platters to put it in, things like that. It cannot be a cost like I'm going to make money at it, but it's an expense cost. Um, but we can give it to other people, and the the liability protection is 100 percent there. So are you, are you seeing at all any venues that are <clears throat> looking at their food waste and thinking about rather than throwing it in a dumpster and sending it to landfill, is there something different that we can do with this food? Is there some way of either composting it differently, reusing it, creating a market for composted food? W what are some of the other elements of, you know, managing to, you know, mitigate food waste going to landfill, you think? Well, my favorite example is Why Boston in the UK. Um, I just talked to Simon, the director of operations from there. They actually have a machine that will compost their breakfast by one o'clock and okay. they are utilizing it. The other aspect of this property in the UK is that they, for every time you, every night you say, I'm not going to, or every guest says, I'm not going to have my room cleaned. They're planting a tree mm. and then they're using that compost and putting the compost on the trees. Okay. So they're keeping, they're a zero waste Mm -hmm. property. And the, the other aspect of that is, can we, I don't know if you've seen a lot of food, um, not pantries, but fridges, the fridge can, like the fridges came about during the pandemic, right? Here's a community fridge. Mm -hmm. um, and in um, Des Moines, Iowa, Eat Greater Des Moines has a community fridge program across the city. And they are actually taking the food from some of these events mm -hmm. places and putting it in the community fridges for people to come and take and and utilize and it's free and it just needs a requirement of a refrigerator and the executive director of the association said that the community in that area is the one that's just taking really hold and 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 managing it and cleaning the refrigerators and doing yeah. all of that why boston is actually doing that with the food in their property as well. They're giving their, for anything that's been prepared but unserved, their employees get first dibs at taking it home. Yeah, so I think so, there are some some very creative things that we mm -hmm. could be doing around yeah. food waste to avoid it going to landfill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we could be taking advantage of the new Food Donation Improvement Act mm -hmm. to really think about, you know, unused food getting donated to uh, communities that, or, you know, they need the food. Right. Well, and even, I think even, and our friend um, Aurora, you know, she talks yeah. to mm -hmm. convention center chefs and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, and then I, my mom, I've got a bag of frozen vegetable peels and, and leftover things in my freezer here. It's like, what are they doing with that excess, the carrot tops and the yeah, yeah. beet peels and things like that, that be, should be, should be used to make soup stocks and, right. and things like that. So exactly. And, it's got a second use and then it will be composted after that, but right. asking and doing those are different steps to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so just as we wrap up here, um, any, any just like last advice for planners in terms of like how to think about food and food choices, um, anything that we haven't talked about at this point that you wanna put out there for, for people to think about when it comes to eating at a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to thank a, for a videographer for that title. But um, I think it's just, we need to think about the, first and foremost, we need to think about the food that we're serving. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many times, it is the number one expenditure on our budget. And majority of the time, it's the thing that we spend the least amount of time on. Mm -hmm. And so with 40% of that going to waste, mm -hmm spend a little, spend 20% more time on your food and beverage, and maybe you can cut that waste by 20%. That's my biggest thing is thinking yeah. about it, being more intentional with what you're doing with it and being thoughtful and incorporating local producers, right. local flavors, you right. know, and um, have fun. Also do a social media thing or an email and say, yeah. Hey, what's your favorite food to eat out to all your attendees and right. somehow figure out how to incorporate that right, into your right. meeting menus. Yeah. That's a great right? idea. So that's have great. fun with it. Um, using, using the local economy. Yeah. So I know, uh, you know, I, as I told you, I was listening to one of your podcasts with Shauna McKinley, who is actually mm -hmm. my guest next month. So tune in next month. Yay. We're going to, we're going to be talking about travel and, uh, 
and the impact of transportation on carbon and events. Mm -hmm. um, but she was mentioning that uh, Project Drawdown for, I don't know if people are familiar with Project Drawdown, but they're an mm -hmm. organization that is looking at all the technologies that are out there and, and trying to assess them in terms of their impact that they have. Um, mm -hmm. Out of their top 10, uh, their top 10 things that can reduce carbon, uh, three of them relate to food. Mm -hmm. um, food waste, plant-based diet, we talked about both of those things today. The other big one, which we did not talk about today, but which is coming down the road and which venues in particular are going to have to think about is electric cooking, moving away from mm -hmm. fossil fuel cooking and moving towards yep. induction and electric cooking. Yep. And if we do those three things, we can have an enormous uh, impact, uh, the savings of 200 gigatons emission reduction. So I'll leave, I'll leave everybody with that stat. Uh, thank you all so much for joining and tune in next month for another edition of Patio Perspectives. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for, uh, thanks for all of your wisdom and insights today. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate being here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. See you next time.